Everybody is already in the webinar. Yeah. yeah. And good morning. Good morning. My name is Jay uh, Godwai. Jay Godwai, I'm the uh, MC of today. I'm from physics department. Uh, today we are on, very honored to have uh, Professor Stephen Chi, uh, Nobel laureate, to give us a talk. And uh, we are very happy that the fact that he can come and he is our honorary alumni too. Uh, before I start, uh, before I doing some introduction, let me introduce some of my uh, our honor guests here, and also introduce Professor Stephen Chi. Uh, in the middle is our president, Professor Alex Wei. Professor Chi, how are you? Can Can you hear us, Steve? And I assume he hear you. <laughs> <laughs> and over here to this side is our provost, uh, Professor Rick Wong. Hi, good evening. And uh, on the other side of uh, the president is the dean, Professor Jimmy Liu. And our department head on his uh, right hand side, uh, Professor Zhao. Thank you. Hope you might have met last time when you were here. And behind me are all our colleagues from the department. Some of them are holding classes that so you might see them later on. Right, uh, for those of you who are not too, uh, uh, probably the first time I've seen Professor Chi and may not be too familiar with his uh, background, I'll just give him a few uh, very brief introduction. Uh, professor Chi is currently the William Cannon Pro uh, Junior Professor of Physics and Professor of Molecular and Cellular Physiology at Stanford University. Now he did his undergraduate in University of Rochester and PhD at uh, UC Berkeley. In 1997, he was awarded the Nobel Prize on using laser to cool and trap atoms. Um, very briefly, between 1987 to 2004, he's a professor of physics in, at Stanford. And in 2004, he was appointed as the director of the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab as we call in Berkeley up the hill there. And in 2009, he became the 12th United States Secretary of Energy under the Obama administration until 2013, when he rejoined Stanford. Now he uh, connected with us, uh, Hong Kong PUs uh, in late 1990s. Uh, first one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Cheung, Lai Ho Cheung spent his sabbatical in Professor Chi's lab I visited him uh, about 1998 or 99, I think. And in 2006, uh, Professor Chi visited us on our 50th anniversary celebration. In fact, he spent a whole week there. So uh, without much further ado, I will stop here. And uh, let me see. Now, I think we should then uh, first uh, have our president who's going to have uh, Give a welcoming speech. It's a pre recorded video. Professor Chu, fellow physicists, scientists, colleagues, and students, today I'm very honored to be able to virtually welcome a well-renowned physicist and our honorary doctor of science, Professor Stephen Chu, to HKBU for this very special online distinguished public lecture. I know you can't wait, so I will be brief. Physics is the mother of all sciences, and the study of energy is fundamental to physics and our understanding of many phenomena. Light as a form of energy enables us to study work and play at night. I'm sure we are all equally amazed and fascinated when we first learned about the true nature of light at school. It's double life as both a particle and a wave, and how that classic double slit experiment displayed its dual characteristics in such a clear way. In fact, my interest in light had never waned, and it has led to my continued fascination 
with the fundamentals of laser and optical communications. As we all know, energy effectively powers everything, physically and metaphorically. For example, we need energy to run our computers, the internet servers and networks that make this Zoom lecture possible. But we also need the kind of inner energy that drives and motivates us so that we can live productively and meaningfully. And thanks to Stephen, who has channeled his energy into exploring the force behind everything, some of the greatest secrets of the universe in terms of laser cooling and the theories of energy conservation have been unlocked. However, one of the most significant things about Stephen lies beyond the personal realm. Over the years, he has been tirelessly applying lasers to the development of renewable energy for the future of our planet and for fighting the global climate crisis. At HKBU, our scholars and students are also carrying out research on energy-related topics. They are tackling one of the biggest challenges of our time, and their work will help ensure a sustainable future by finding scientific solutions to these energy issues. Stephen is a shining example that we all look up to, and his innovative mindset and commitment continue to inspire us all. For the benefit of those who are not in physics, the method Stephen uses is called Sisyphus cooling. It uses laser to cool atoms to temperatures below the Doppler cooling limit, and a fraction above absolute zero. The method is named after the figure in Greek mythology who was sentenced for all eternity to roll a gigantic rock uphill, only to have it roll back down each time he got it near the top. It so happens that the Greek myth of Sisyphus is my favorite story in Greek mythology. Contrary to Sisyphus' eternal punishment and the cooling method named after him, Stephen's achievements continue to soar to new heights. Not even the sky is the limit. To me and to many other physicists, absolute truth exists only in the realm of natural sciences. Everywhere else, truth is relative. Perhaps the only exception to this is that it is absolutely true to say that Stephen's energy is boundless. He's a keen sportsman who swims and cycles, and he also plays baseball and tennis. On top of that, he teaches, conducts research, served as the United States Secretary of Energy, and won the Nobel Prize. Stephen is the human version of a perpetual motion machine. It would be nice if Stephen can at least share with us the secret to his dynamism, which enables him to work across a wide spectrum of activities despite his limited time. Once again, welcome to HKBU, Stephen. It's a real privilege to have you here virtually. On behalf of the university, thank you for giving this lecture. Please enlighten us, Professor. We look forward to benefiting from your wisdom and teachings, and I'm sure all of us will be energized by your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Wai. Now I'd like to ask, uh, invite uh, Professor Chow or Department Head to give a very brief introduction. Yeah, dear distinguished Professor Chi, President uh, Professor Wai, Provost Professor Wong, uh, Sun Sting, uh, Professor Liu, uh, colleagues, students, and uh, guests. It is a great honor uh, for the Department of Physics in the Faculty of Science to host this uh, distinguished lecture by Professor Ji, 1997 Nobel Prize winner in physics on climate change and the innovative uh, passes to a sustainable future. We are living in a transformative type, time driven by technology while also facing imperative global challenges, such as climate change, public health, that closely affect the life of uh, every of one of us and uh, the society as a whole. 
in the Department of Physics at Hong Kong B, uh, HKBU. Our research and the education programs sent around the great opportunities offered by these grand challenges. And we see scientific research and technology innovation are the key for seeking solutions to tackle these grand challenges. The research in our department focuses on two niche areas. One is advanced materials, especially energy materials and devices. The other niche area is biophysics and complex systems, such as cancer, brain study, human microbiome, and the stat uh, statistical physics analysis and the modeling of these complex systems. It is particularly exciting that uh, the 2021 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to scientists that pioneered the complex system studies such as on global warming. On the education side, our undergraduate and master programs focus on green energy and smart technology. We aim to nurture young professionals with the knowledge and the practical skills to develop and implement green and smart technology different apologies for the rapidly growing demand of the society for smart and net zero carbon development. So we very much look forward to the insightful lecture by Professor Ji, and we hope to welcome prospective students and researchers to join us to seek in innovative paths to a sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chow. Now I'd like to invite my colleagues to step forward to the center. Then we are going to take a group photograph. Steve, stay where you are. You, you're going to be behind us on the screen. Thank you. Right. Right, we're going to start. And uh, today we, uh, Professor Chi is going to talk about a very timely title, Climate Change and Innovative Paths to a Sustainable Future. So over to you, Steve. Well, thank you first for a very kind introduction, but um, overly flattering. Um, so I'm, I can only disappoint. Um, before I start, I just want to mention first, um, I uh, am still very active in research, both in biology uh, and new areas in energy batteries, uh, which I will talk a little bit about. Um, but also uh, the comment about folks, um, in your physics department, what you what you are concentrating, it just so happens that I am also working on new materials, both for energy and other things, uh, including materials for optical probes for biology. And we are about to submit a paper where we have developed new probes, use them to measure the transport in live neurons. And in the analysis of this, we have actually proven um, a few new theorems in, in uh, non-equilibrium uh, statistical mechanics. And as noted, uh, this year's Nobel Prize was uh, given to people who've been studying complex systems, both complex climate systems, but also co other complex systems, uh, which also include um, non-equilibrium uh, thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. So, so it turns out that um, 
in the last five, 10, even 15 years, that area has been really alive. And we found that in a biological system, we, it is uh, significantly out of thermal equilibrium. And it's the first system, I believe, um, uh, in a living system, certainly, uh, that where you can operate well out of thermal equilibrium from the environment of the cell. So it was very exciting. But let me stop there about, uh, let's see, host is disabled screen sharing. So you need to enable me to screen share. Let me know when that's okay. Uh, Still, I'm not able to screen share. Aha, very good, thank you. Okay, so let me begin by getting rid of this and getting that and making that go away. All right, so um, I'm gonna be talking about climate change and solutions, potential solutions. Um, and um, I'm sorry, I didn't change the um, subtitle, <laughs> but um, I, it is a new talk. <laughs> I just used the uh, slide. So let me very briefly talk about what's been happening. I'm sure you all know between 1850 and 2020, the average temperature of the earth has gone up. Uh, remarkably, most of it has gone up since 1920. Uh, we can see these changes around us. If you look for anecdotal evidence, uh, this is a picture of a Muir Glacier, a famous glacier in Alaska in the United States taken in 1941. And 2004, it looked very different. And more recently, it even looks more different. So, but this is anecdotal evidence. Uh, but we've seen over the years, and especially over the last five and 10 years, Things that I personally did not think I would ever live to see are now happening much earlier than I expected 15, 20 years ago, or even 10 years ago. So we're beginning to see increased heat waves, uh, crazy temperatures all around the world, uh, floods that are killing people, uh, huge forest fires, droughts, increased water shortages in the United States, the whole Western part of the United States seems to now be in a perennial water shortage over the last decade or more. And increasingly, um, the specter of crop failures and rising seas. And so all these things could in part create, if not tens, maybe even hundreds of millions of climate refugees in the coming decades. And just to give you a feeling for what I mean by that, this is um, a map of where we consider the water stresses to uh, occur. They currently are there now, but they're going to be much greater because to perhaps oversimplify, uh, what we're seeing is that the wetter places become wetter, the drier places become drier. The summer months where you're growing food are hotter and the snow-capped mountains that are part of the reservoirs of many countries around the world are not holding as much water because instead of spring snows, we see spring rains. And so this is what we think is in store for us if we um, continue on the path we're going and even um, if we take drastic action, these things are already occurring. Now, if you think of any lesson that can be learned from COVID uh, pandemic, it's that if the rich countries ignore the entire world uh, and think they can isolate themselves and seal themselves off from the entire world, uh, they would be mistaken. And so this is what indeed what happened when the rich countries, the United States uh, in particular, were not aggressive about producing enough vaccines and sharing vaccines with the rest of the world. And in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, the vast majority of the people were not, uh, did not receive vaccines. And what we think might have happened, uh, and this was also true of the Delta variant that uh, was believed to originate in India, 
that um, if left out of control and the virus is allowed to just simply mutate, uh, viruses do mutate. And then you have a store of uh, humans that we can actually let this virus mutate. And so far, what we do know is the Omicron variant is much more contagious, whether it is uh, more deadly or less deadly, we don't know, but it's certainly more contagious than the other variants of COVID. And so I liken this to, in terms of climate change, I think the whole world is on a very small planet and we have to take care of the entire world, just not rich countries take care of themselves because of this climate refugee problem. We've already seen what happens when just 5 million refugees uh, want to go into Europe. Even less than a million refugees want to go into the United States from Central America. Uh, there uh, bad things happen. All right. So um, in any case, let me um, also talk about the present path we're on. And on the present path, there could be many things. If we have no climate policies, uh, the fear is that the earth will warm up to perhaps four to 4.8 degrees. Let me remind you that um, many climate scientists uh, feel that if the world is allowed to go over one and a half degrees since the beginning of the industrial revolution and certainly two degrees, uh, there would be much more risks. Now, unfortunately, we're at about 1.1 degrees since the Industrial Revolution, 80% of having occurred over the last 60, 70 years. And so uh, in a certain sense, the chance of staying below one and a half degrees has passed us by. How much more above one and a half or even two degrees we will go uh, really depends on what happens. And um, as you see in this yellow, uh, if all the countries uh, meet all the pledges that they've made in the Paris uh, COP agreement, we will go somewhere between 2.5 to 2.8 degrees. And again, just to remind you, we're only 1.1 degrees higher than the Industrial Revolution, and already we're seeing significant effects from climate change. All right. So... The other thing I need to remind you is that it's not the rate of emitting carbon dioxide per year or other greenhouse gases, it's the cumulative emissions. And the reason it's the cumulative emissions is because uh, once you throw carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, very quickly, about half of it gets absorbed by the oceans and by land, increased vegetation and land, um, the ocean acidifies, there's inorganic uh, dissolving of carbon dioxide. And, um, but the rest of it actually circulates rapidly between land and the atmosphere, between the ocean, land and the atmosphere. And it's not clear how long that circulates, but uh, the literature has estimates ranging from a thousand years to perhaps even 10,000 years as the lifetime of the natural sequestration of carbon dioxide if the earth does not go into any tipping points. And so right now, this is where we are, the 2,900 uh, billion tons, gigatons of carbon dioxide is considered the tipping point to go um, over one and a half and even two degrees. Um, and so um, there has been said, I don't know if it's really true, but the father of Taoism uh, said, if you don't change direction, you will end up where you're heading. And so where we're heading and where we'll pass, we'll pass that red dotted line, perhaps in 20, 25 years. Um, all right, so let's talk about what to do about it. One of my favorite sayings was said by uh, Sheikh Yamani. He was a former Saudi oil minister. And he said the Stone Age came to an end, not for lack of stones and the oil age, well, End, but not for lack of oil. So what did he really mean by that? And is that why he's the former oil minister? And the answer, I believe, is that we transitioned from the Stone Age to the Metal Age because 
metals were better than stones. And in this transition, we don't look at stones on the ground and says, if it wasn't for environmentalists, we would not have, we would not have these, um, uh, you know, abandoned assets. Uh, and so we don't think of stones as assets anymore because we have better solutions. And so the real issue is, can we transition away from fossil fuel because we have better solutions? Now, what is not said, but is the corollary is that if you don't find better solutions, if uh, clean energy, for example, uh, remains more expensive than fossil, than renewable energy, uh, and you're sitting on top of billions, if not trillions of dollars of oil and natural gas, that stuff will come out of the ground. So let's talk about solutions. Well, uh, again, a reminder that there's been remarkable progress in the cost of solar energy. Uh, the solar modules, the heart of the solar system's price has declined more than 200 fold since 1977, not 97, that's a misprint. But even um, in the last 10 years, it's declined more than eight fold. This is remarkable progress. And there's every expectation that it will continue to decline uh, the overall cost of solar energy and the cost of solar modules by probably or at least another twofold. That's great stuff. Um, it can also transform the world in many ways. For example, these are pictures of um, Sub Saharan Africa, where in many part, poor parts of the world, uh, we don't, they don't use fossil fuel, they don't use gasoline, they don't use diesel. Uh, in fact, they're poor enough that they don't really have animals to, to actually uh, haul around goods and uh, services. And in many places of the world, um, the dominant power is actually human power. The uh, uh, picture on the right, I've actually seen with my own eyes, they would put up a hundred kilos of potatoes, put it on top of a bicycle and just push the bicycle. And uh, on the left, there are women um, where there is no plumbing. So they go to the village well and they uh, bring water back to their homes. And um, with solar energy, there's a possibility that you can really change people's lives. For example, irrigation may become possible because when the sun shines, you pump water from the ground. Once it's above the ground, you can store it in a water tower. You can purify water uh, because you don't need the electricity on 24 seven. Again, when the sun shines, you can use it to uh, disinfect the water. And ultimately, if uh, electric bicycles or three wheelers become less expensive, uh, then there opens up the possibility that you can bypass leapfrog beyond gasoline and diesel fuel. Again, charging these devices with local solar power. Um, uh, right now, uh, the price for purchasing an electric bicycle is prohibitive. The price will come down maybe fivefold, maybe tenfold, but certainly threefold for sure. Um, but even then the price would be too high. And so you need a new business model. But Africa actually has a new business model. Um, cell phone technology swept through Africa and South Asia. Um, not everybody has an iPhone, of course, but you know, your basic uh, cell phone, uh, uh, virtually everybody has and you don't even have to buy the cell phone, you can actually rent it as part of the service. So that's what I talked about a new business model. Let's talk about wind. Wind is now about 5%, it's over 5% of the worldwide electrical generation. This is how partitions between Europe, Asia and North America. The technology for wind, even though it's um, been around for 20, 30, 40 years, uh, well, hundreds of years, if you consider the earlier uh, windmills, uh, it continues to get better. This is a picture on the left-hand side of a 12 megawatt General Electric wind turbine. Uh, Siemens Gamesa are making similarly large turbines. Uh, the size of the turbines, are, their wingspan is, is uh, approaching 300 meters. 
uh, that little thing on the top in those red fence is a little helicopter landing pad. So these are huge wind turbines. And um, the National Grid, which is responsible for the power electrical distribution in Great Britain, feels that offshore wind, which is so far about two, two and a half times more expensive than onshore wind, uh, its price is also coming down very rapidly. And by 2020, 2025, 20, at the outset, uh, the national grid system in Great Britain feels that offshore wind will actually be competitive with um, natural gas in Great Britain. So that would be remarkable. That's all good news. But uh, the issue is the full cost of renewable energy has to include backup generation capacity. It has to include energy storage and it has to include an enhanced transmission and distribution system. When you're five, 10, 20% wind and solar, even 30%, it's just an add-on that's all great. You essentially have your old system still there. But once you get to 50, 60% or greater, it becomes a real issue uh, on how you actually maintain a robust energy supply. Uh, and so it turns out renewable energy has to get less expensive than fossil fuel because it, in fact, is going to have to pay for all these other things. So let me start with the most important thing right now that needs to be solved, which is energy storage. So here's um, a picture of my favorite battery. Uh, it's to remind people that when the wind blows, you pump water uh, out from under the ground, put it in a water tower. And then when you want to irrigate your crops, you just open up a valve. And so the idea is very simple. When the renewable energy is on, do the things that you know you will have to do and where you can save energy. It does not have to be in the form of a chemical battery. It turns out that pump storage is uh, more than 95% of all the energy storage in the world. And uh, China has invested heavily in pump storage. Uh, they had planned, I'm not sure if they achieved it, but I'm pretty sure they have, that to have installed an additional 40 gigawatts of pump storage by 2020. Uh, they are the leader in the world in pump storage, followed by Japan and the United States. Uh, the United States has huge pump storage capacity, and uh, but we're still a little bit far behind in trying to install this. My point is once you have in a hydroelectric dam, pump storage becomes a, the most inexpensive form of stored energy. And um, so, uh, and the idea is very simple. It, the energy is stored by gravity. Uh, you have an upper basin, you have a lower basin. Uh, when you let water down the dam, it turns a turbine, generates electricity and off you go. If you have excess, wind or solar energy, for example, this generator becomes a motor and the turbine pump turbine can be run backwards and it takes water from a small holding pond below the dam and pumps it uphill. Remarkably, the round trip efficiency time, including all the losses of the generator, the pump turbine, the friction in the pipes and everything, uh, can be actually greater than 80% efficient, uh, excluding evaporation. And so this is actually comparable or better than chemical flow batteries that are being considered now. So this is a technology we have today. We just have to start making little, little reservoirs below if you have hydroelectric dams. The only trouble is it's um, not every country has access to the geography that allows you to have hydroelectric dams. All right, so let's talk about storage. It's been estimated that in the United States, if you want to be 80% renewable energy, wind and solar, we, and we have a little bit of hydro, um, you need three days of energy storage. Three days doesn't sound like very much, but what that really means is you need enough energy stored as if you could run the entire electrical system for three days. If you do a calculation of what that would require, it turns out it's 10,000 times more 
chemical battery storage than we have existing in the US. And the cost of the chemical battery storage right now is about $300 a kilowatt hour. Uh, people are comfortable that within a decade, decade and a half, it may go down to as low as $100 a kilowatt hour. But we believe unless you want to significantly increase the energy prices, it would have to be at perhaps $20 a kilowatt hour. And for the next couple of decades, we have no technologies that we think will actually allow that to happen. So another way of saying this is that the batteries that we know about how to build today or in the next decade or two, don't are out of the price range of sufficient energy storage to run 80% of the electrical system of the United States with renewable energy. And the United States has some of the best renewable energy resources in the entire world. So what can you do? Well, when the sun is shining, uh, electricity can be very inexpensive and also wind energy is getting into this range as well. And so we think that, and not only I uh, and others like me, but in fact, major oil companies think that in the best sites around the world, within a decade, uh, clean energy can cost as little as one to one and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Right now in the Middle East, uh, uh, power purchase agreements, these are signed contracts where a developer agrees to build a solar farm, which includes their profit over the uh, amortized uh, investment of the solar farm. Uh, and they're signing contracts as less than two cents a kilowatt hour uh, as of a couple of years ago. And so we think that this optimism is not completely uh, unfounded. Now, something magically happens when electricity gets to this price. Right now, in most places around the world, it's four to five cents a kilowatt hour for wholesale electricity. That's considered low cost electricity. Many places, including Hong Kong, it's significantly higher than that. But at one and a half cents a kilowatt hour, the cost of electricity is only half the cost of making hydrogen from current technology of electrolysis. So we begin, begin to think about creating very clean hydrogen. Today, hydrogen is produced uh, by uh, taking methane gas and doing steam reformation where you get the hydrogen gas, but you also make a lot of carbon dioxide. So in the transformation of natural gas to carbon dioxide, you actually haven't reduced the emission of carbon dioxide. In fact, you've increased it a little bit. So, so we need a clean way of making hydrogen. Um, but nevertheless, uh, people are beginning to think hard about how to make hydrogen from renewables, from nuclear. Right now, as I said, it's primarily from uh, methane gas. And so hydrogen, you can think of as just a means of taking energy and storing it. But unlike a chemical battery, which has a lot of overhead, of all the anode and cathode and electrolyte materials, uh, you have the chemical energy. Uh, and the question is, can you store that chemical energy, produce it, and then recover it, either in direct heat by burning hydrogen or else uh, by using fuel cells and other methods to convert it back to electricity. So this is being considered right now. Green hydrogen is non-economical. Hopefully, uh, with improved methods of electrolysis, it can be uh, better. And of course, we're also anticipating that the cost of renewable energy will go down at the best places. And so you're going to make hydrogen at the best places. And then the question is, how are you going to transport it? And in this diagram, you see ammonia fertilizer. That's what we use hydrogen K for. Um, but uh, people are now considering perhaps you can store hydrogen in the form of ammonia, which you can liquefy. All right. Um, other ideas of energy storage, uh, using heat storage mechanisms instead of pumped hydro. Again, pumped hydro is the best, uh, but there's a possibility that using very efficient turbines, you can use 
uh, heat pumping methods to take uh, excess electricity, turn it into heat storage, and then turn it back either into electricity or use the heat directly for processing. One of the things people don't talk about is that process heat, which is the lowest cost form of heat, which is supplied by coal and natural gas today, uh, is, is the lowest form cost of heat, and that has to be solved as well. We use a lot of process heat. Uh, uh, the entire chemical uh, and plastic industry is a petrochemical industry, and those petrochemicals are using process heat. So that's another challenge we have is, is we need to store energy storage for process heat. Transmission distribution. Um, there is technology that has been developed initially in Europe by Siemens and ABB. Uh, then in collaboration with those companies, China has built a very high voltage electrical grid system. And uh, the longest high voltage DC line, not AC, but, but DC line, uh, actually carries in two wires, six gigawatts of energy. And in over 3,200 kilometers, uh, less than 5% of the energy is lost due to transmission losses. And so this is phenomenal. You don't really need superconductors to um, transport electric electricity, for example, in the upper Northeast portion of China where wind resources are very good also in the, in the North, oops, uh, where am I? Uh, the northwest portion of China, the northeast part portion of China, you have very, very good wind resources. You have tremendous hydro resources in the southwestern part of China. Uh, despite that, they have not yet hooked up a system where if you have excess wind or solar, you can actually reverse the lines and start to pump water where all the pumped hydro is. But that is something that needs to be done and coordinated. And it's, while it sounds in principle, uh, very doable, it's complicated. Um, and so despite this great transmission system, you also need a very smart distribution system. And even at uh, 10, 15% energy, China is actually dumping a lot of excess wind and solar energy into the ground because uh, they can't use it all. And so this is, again, the world has to learn how to do this. Um, in Europe, the United States, in California, we're 35% of wind and solar right now. Uh, we dump far less energy, but it still uh, gets harder and harder as you go to 50% and over 50%. Uh, to give you a scale for what these high voltage components look like in this little uh, cherry picker crane are people. And this is the standoff between the, what is needed uh, in a 1.1 million volt DC line. All right, let's move on to electric vehicles. A um, little history lesson. On the left-hand picture is a photograph of New York City, an Easter morning, a tradition in New York City that you have an Easter parade. And this is Fifth Avenue. And you notice that the people are just all dressed up in their Sunday best. Uh, and parading along Fifth Avenue are horse-drawn carriages. You fast forward just 13 years and you find that the nature of the Easter Parade has dramatically changed. Uh, this is Fifth Avenue 13 years later and all you see are motor cars. Uh, that's not quite true. Right here is one motor car and right here is one horse-drawn carriage. And so how did this transition happen so fast? Well, if you think about it, it's remarkable because it requires a whole new infrastructure. It required an oil gasoline supply chain. It required paved roads, repair shops, gasoline distribution uh, service stations, the whole works. But the reason it occurred so fast, one of the reasons was a serious environmental pollution problem uh, made the transition much faster. So what was the problem? The problem was in Manhattan and Brooklyn, there were 160,000 horses. And uh, the horses would poop every day. 
and they were producing three to four million pounds of horse manure a day. And it was piling up in all the vacant lots. It was strewn around the streets. And as soon as people invented a poopless carriage, uh, you just think, ah, that's much cleaner. And the transition was very fast. What's the equivalent of a poopless carriage today? Well, there's climate change, but there's even uh, other issues, very serious local air pollution. This is Be Beijing and a bad air day. And what we've discovered is that particulate matter, PM 2.5, that's particles smaller than two and a half micron in diameter, is especially deadly. There are studies that are indicating for every five micrograms per cubic meter of these very small particles, there's an 18% higher chance of getting lung cancer. So this followed 300,000 people for over uh, 12 years. Um, now, in 2016, the average air in Beijing was 76 micrograms per cubic meter. It has gotten better since then, but it is still far above uh, this five micrograms per cubic meter. But uh, also the World Health Organization guidelines are saying that PM 2.5 levels for quote clean air are 10 micrograms per cubic meter. But if you consider 10 micrograms per cubic meter, that's a 36 time percent higher chance of getting lung cancer, which if not detected early still remains fatal. So one doesn't really consider a 36% higher chance of getting lung cancer as clean air. Uh, the guidelines are being revisited and the thing that's keeping the putting guideline to three micrograms per cubic meter, which has been recommended, is the economic cost. Uh, the short-term economic cost, not the long-term economic cost of people dying. Um, also, we know that just like smoking, uh, the victims of PM 2.5, it, it's not lung cancer that's the biggest killer. It turns out to be coronary disease, stroke, lung cancer, and, and COPD in that order uh, as the biggest causes of both smoking and of the small particulate um, air. So this is also a big incentive uh, in many countries around the world, especially in metropolitan areas, to uh, change um, the regulations that will begin to forbid internal combustion engine cars and trucks in cities. Now, if you look at the projections of what electrical vehicles will be, uh, there's uh, a hope uh, that perhaps by 2040, more than 50% of all the new cars and light trucks, these are pickup trucks or SUVs sold around the world could be uh, electric vehicles. That's the good news. The bad news is that it means 45% of the new light vehicle sales will be um, internal combustion engine cars, but they have lifetimes, not only the original owner, but the people who buy the used vehicles of at least 15 years on average and so that means that uh, even by 2040, if the majority of vehicles, light duty vehicles are, inter are EVs, uh, it will still take several decades to make the transition from 2021 to significantly past 2050. All right, so, so that gives you an idea of um, the time of the transition. What about the technology? Well, this is, um, a graph on the x-axis is the energy density per unit weight. On the y-axis is energy density per unit volume. Um, and driven largely by first laptop computers, but especially mobile phones, uh, batteries have dramatically improved, especially the energy density per unit volume. And so right here, you have a, a reference of the Tesla S1 battery. Uh, and in terms of where it is in energy density per unit weight and per unit volume, um, many people, including myself, think that uh, perhaps uh, in a decade or two at the outset, uh, we will be somewhere around here. So that's great news. 
uh, that the energy density will double in terms of weight and, and uh, nearly double in terms of volume. Um, all right, so that's good news, but what about lithium? Uh, so we published a paper, Chong Lu was the postdoc who was co-directed by Yi Sui and myself. She's now an assistant professor at the University of Chicago. And we just published a paper a year and a half ago that showed you can extract lithium using um, electrolysis, one cycle of electrolysis uh, from seawater. And the challenge there is that in seawater, the ratio of sodium to lithium is about 20,000 to one. And she also showed uh, that from salty lake water, uh, we got some, salt, uh, some salty lake water from Utah, that if you have a molar concentration of somewhere about one in a thousand, one in 200, you get uh, 98, 99% lithium in one pass and uh, produce water from oil. When you go drilling from oil, you find, and you're lucky, you might find oil, you will find natural gas, and you find lots of salty water. And then again, uh, in the amount of salty water produced from oil drilling, uh, we show that you can get 95% uh, lithium to sodium. Now, once it's over 50%, you can put in carbonates and precipitate out the sodium and isolate, precipitate out the lithium and isolate easily from the sodium. So this does offer the possibility that you can actually um, make this economical. Uh, it remains to be seen. Uh, the material has to be used for hundreds, if not thousands of cycles. And she is working on that. In the meantime, a postdoc of mine and I, in collaboration with Yi, are working on a new approach to extracting lithium from um, seawater or salty water. Um, what about the current uh, batteries that are used in EVs today? Well, there are two types. The most common one is uses um, uh, some compounds that use a mixture of a nickel, manganese, and cobalt. Um, the cell phone batteries use cobalt oxide, the, uh, which was the first commercial lithium ion battery uh, that John Goodenough discovered. And uh, that battery work was awarded the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago for lithium ion batteries. Um, but um, uh, cobalt and even nickel would be too expensive if you want to get a, uh, the vast majority, if not 80, 90, 100% of the vehicles uh, running on clean electricity. And so what I am doing with, uh, again, uh, a postdoc of mine now, a uh, uh, research scientist, and each way are we are trying to figure out how to use uh, lithium metal as an anode. So you dispense with the carbon, it's just pure metal. When you do that, the density, uh, energy density increases more than tenfold. And, uh, and ideally, if we can use sulfur as the um, cathode, sulfur is plentiful. Um, we have mountains and mountains of sulfur extracted from um, uh, oil because of the regulations of low sulfur gasoline and diesel fuel and low sulfur fuels in general. Uh, so we have tons of sulfur. Uh, we don't know what to do with it, in fact. And so if you could make a, a high energy density battery of sulfur, that would be terrific. Uh, there's some good news here, I think, at least on the research front, we are about to submit a paper where we've shown uh, that in a half battery in a lithium metal anode, we can have a thousand stable cycles. And for a full battery, uh, we have completely stable cycles until roughly 300 cycles. At that point, the electrolyte is gobbled up by some chemical reactions with the sulfur of the electrolyte we use. Uh, we're using, we're experimenting with different electrolytes, and um, I think it's going to be a solvable problem when you get an electrolyte that does not react with sulfur, then uh, this approach could work. Um, 
let's go get back to energy storage on mobile platforms. And again, here's energy density per unit volume on the y-axis, energy density per unit weight on the uh, x-axis. And here you have the highest chemical energy density is over here, gasoline, diesel, kerosene, and fat. Where is the lithium ion battery today? Well, it's down here. It's nearly very close to zero. Uh, but if the energy density can actually increase by three, maybe fourfold, the whole energy landscape would be transformed, in part because the electric motors are 95%, 98% efficient, uh, whereas the internal combustion engine motors are maybe 35, pushing 40% efficient for the most efficient ones. So, so you um, don't need as much efficiency and uh, it's, you still won't have the energy density of liquid hydrocarbons. To impress upon you how high this energy density is, I have a little quiz and because I'm a professor and we ask questions. So on the right-hand side, you have a Boeing 777. It's one of the long range uh, jets that are used to transport both people and freight. And the question is, what does a Boeing 77 have in common with a barred tailed godwit? What is a barred tailed godwit? Well, it's a bird. It's a bird um, that's, you know, I don't know, like a chicken sized bird. And whatever, for whatever reason, this bird spends half of its time uh, in Alaska, and then it decides to migrate, and it actually migrates to New Zealand. Now, when they found out how it migrates, many, many of the birds actually stop off and do have a refueling stop in China, but with the advent of very, very lightweight global positioning satellite things, they've tagged some of these birds, and they found out a significant fraction of them actually fly from Alaska, they go over Hawaii as just a navigation tool, and then they turn towards New Zealand and they never stop flying. And so what does it have in common? Both planes can fly nonstop 11,000 kilometers. And when both planes take off when, for these 11,000 kilometer flights, more than half of the total weight uh, is a fuel. And so the Bartel Godwick starts up as a fat bird. And by the time it lands in New Zealand, it's a very skinny bird. Anyway, it's remarkable, but this is, you know, body fat or uh, liquid hydrocarbons are the most efficient energy carrier we have today, barring nuclear. Another thing is how it transport. This is a picture of a super tanker. And if I ask the question, how, let me see if I can get this away from this thing. If I ask how much does it cost per gallon of gasoline, does it cost to ship crude oil and store it, let's say halfway around the world? The answer is two cents a gallon of gasoline. The transportation costs are very little of the cost of transporting liquid hydrocarbons. And it's for this reason that super tankers actually are, in a certain sense, the intercontinental energy transmission lines across oceans. We're not gonna have high voltage lines across the Pacific Ocean, but we do have super tankers. And so that's why it becomes important if renewable energy comes very, very inexpensive in let's say Northern Africa, in the Middle East and other parts of the world, that you're able to store this chemical energy in some liquid form that you can put on a tanker and ship it across the world. Once it arrives on shore, you can then want to still store it in liquid form. So the countries have energy security in an energy reservoir, just as we have energy reservoirs of oil on the shores of developed countries. So again, this is, uh, a target, this is what we need, uh, we're not there yet. Finally, let's talk about more issues about where the greenhouse gases are coming from. I talked about industrial processes, fossil fuel for generating electricity, for heat. We also know that uh, 
forestry land use uh, generates uh, methane. Uh, this is this light purple. This is when you deforest things and other land use, uh, you actually generate greenhouse gases. N2O is nitrous oxide. It's mostly due to fertilizer over fertilization and fertilizer runoff. So if you look at all of these issues and you add up what are the emissions due to agriculture and raising animals, it turns out there are more greenhouse gas emissions from these activities than there is from all of electricity power generation around the world. So for that reason, we will need a new agricultural revolution. Well, we've had several agricultural revolutions. For example, if you look at the native corn and how it got domesticated and bred to modern corn, it's easy to spot what was the native corn hundreds of years ago to today's corn. We've also bred animals to grow very rapidly in a very short period of time. If these circles for beef, pigs, and chickens, the full circumference of the circle would be the natural lifetime of the animals, it turns out that most beef are slaughtered between 18 and 24 months after birth, pigs 22 to 26 weeks, and broiler chickens only 40 days. So this is remarkable because if you consider the average American pig, by the time it's slaughtered and after only 24 weeks, it weighs 280 pounds. This is a very big animal. And so these livestock have been bred to, for early growth and it's a very small fraction of their natural life cycle. Let me give you another example. These are domestic American type turkeys. Uh, they're slaughtered only th after three and a half months after birth. And these turkeys, when they're uh, killed for Thanksgiving dinner, for example, um, they can weigh 15, 18 pounds uh, if you include the insides. And so very, very fast growing turkeys. They also don't really look like um, uh, wild turkeys. And in fact, they're in America, Americans like white meat, breast meat. And so they've been bred to be so breast heavy that many of them can't even mate. So they're actually reproduced by artificial insemination. So this is an industrialization of uh, animals. If I, uh, so now, the, one of the issues uh, is beef because beef uh, are particularly inefficient and because when they, uh, they pass a lot of methane gas, both in burping and out the back end. But if you consider beef and dairy cows and consider all the greenhouse gas emissions used from raising the food, the fertilizer, the fertilizer runoff and the methane production and the animal waste methane production, it turns out that if beef and dairy cattle were a country, uh, they would be emitting 4.6 billion tons equivalent of CO2 per year. That's more than the EU. It's uh, actually becoming more than the United States. And the only country that exceeds beef and dairy cows as uh, greenhouse gas emission would be China. So this is very significant. So how do you actually decrease uh, this? There are many ways. Uh, one way is eat less beef. Uh, if you compare beef to chickens or pigs, it's uh, two, three, four times as much greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, I should also say that modern agriculture and the raising of animals for food has really distorted the world. If you consider all the human bi biomass and all the animals we eat and put them on one side of the scale, and put all the mammals, the rest of the mammals, these are the wild mammals, the lions, the tigers, the bear, the deer, the rats, the mice, everything on the other side of the scale. Humans and the animals we eat constitute 96% of all mammal mass. It's just astounding how we've shaped uh, and geoengineered the world. Um, there are attempts to try to make beef substitutes based on plants uh, beyond beef and impossible foods are two startup companies in the United States. Uh, a friend of mine founded Impossible Burger Food 
And um, this is made from plant-based soy base, but it does not taste like a soy burger. It actually is a reasonable approximation to hamburger. Uh, but there's a lot of exotic biochemistry in these things. I know, for example, the Impossible Food Burgers actually um, uh, use a hemoglobin-like molecule that was originally derived from soy, but then they found it was not economical to, to get this molecule from the roots of soy plants. So they just train yeast how to grow hemoglobin and, uh, and they stick it in the food. And so it gives us this blood-like taste. Uh, still not perfect, and, um, uh, but it's happening. Um, another uh, is milk substitutes. Uh, soy milk was the start, followed by almond milk, but almonds require a lot of water. So it's not really conducive uh, to the environment because of the water shortages. Uh, oats are also gaining in popularity. And so the issue is whether some mixture of soy and especially oat milk can actually begin to substitute for dairy products for milk. Uh, the thing we haven't figured out is um, how to make good cheese from uh, plants because the, there's a certain molecule proteins, casein in particular, that's actually essential for making the best cheeses and uh, that does not appear in plants. Uh, and so the question is, can you make casein from, from organisms like yeast economically so you can compete favorably with dairy products? But in addition to animals uh, and animal meat substitutes and milk substitutes, you can actually begin to transform plant-based agriculture as well. And so um, there are certain plants like legumes who actually in the layer between the roots and the soil, there's a layer called rhizome where bacteria live. And these plants uh, establish symbiotic relationships so that microbes, not necessarily bacteria, but microbes in general can actually supply the plant with nitrogen compounds that act as fertilizer that they glean from the soil that's arrived not from fertilizing the soil, but from just natural processes of atmospheric nitrogen. And so the question is, can you develop a set of microbes that can form these symbiotic relationships with plants like corn? And the answer is you can. And um, there's a company in the Bay Area called Pivot Bio that has um, been planting since 2019. And on the right is uh, corn raised by microbes. When you plant the corn, instead of putting lots of fertilizer, you use half the fertilizer and half of the microbes. Hopefully we can get to three quarters or maybe even more of the fertilizer. Not only the nitrogen-based fertilizer, but phosphates as well. And, and so it can begin to supplant uh, the uh, fertilizers we make using the Haber-Bosch process uh, and he heavy energy inputs. And remember, N2O is a huge greenhouse gas effect. And so you will not have fertilizer runoff as well. So this is, again, where science could help come to the rescue to uh, give us this additional, uh, this is somehow, Ah, uh, this is my joke. I somehow miss up my slides. Uh, my joke about turkeys and how the domestic turkeys in the United States were unrecognizable uh, compared to wild turkeys of unknown ages. But in the United States, there's a popular bourbon called wild turkey. And for example, 101 wild turkey, it's 101 proof. We know how old that is, but never mind. Um, so, um, so in uh, developing these microbes um, on the board of um, uh, what we call a synthetic biology company, where we're actually helping Pivot Bio uh, manipulate the microbes so you can actually um, make much, much better microbes. And again, not only for nitrogen-based uh, fertilizer for corn, we will also, of course, want to do it for wheat and oats. But, and, and, and ideally for rice and figure out how to do it for rice where you 
the flooding and the generation of methane from flooding rice paddies can also be largely eliminated. Again, a challenge. We're not there yet. Um, let me close by, uh, you can't talk about renewable energy unless you talk about um, population. And so I uh, bring your attention to uh, a website called Gapminder. It was founded by Hans Rosling, who died recently, but it's being carried forth by his children. And what he does is he puts data at your fingertips. At your fingertips means you can actually manipulate the data yourself. For example, if I choose to see this, uh, what the birth rate is per woman in a country versus the income of a country, and you can cycle from beginning in 1800, and I picked several countries, the United States, Mexico, India, and Germany, and this is where you are in 1912. So as the years advance, the income advances, and the fertility rate goes down. There are fewer babies per family. And by the time you're 2018, you find the United States, oh, by the way, 2.1 babies per family is necessary for a stable population. Not a growing population, but not a declining population. It has to be slightly over two because of uh, mortality in, in childhood and early adulthood. And in any case, the United States is negative. Germany is definitely negative. Uh, if it weren't for uh, an immigrant population in the United States, we'd be down where Germany is and where Japan is around 1.3, 1.4 per person. China is now negative, but you say, well, that might be due to their one child policy, but India, which is not rich and where it's over here, it's now at about 2.4 per income, but it's income. This is, you notice this is on a log scale, 64,000 per average American income. Uh, per person, and that's eight. So it's eight times less wealthy, and yet the fertility rate is going down. This is in part a good thing, but it's been viewed by economists as a bad thing uh, because um, they're saying, well, we need more babies, so you have more young people to support a smaller, older population, and that's how you grow an economy. And um, this is um, actually not a good solution. Um, and in fact, in principle, we need a different measure of wealth. The way we measure wealth of a country is GDP. GDP means you make and use stuff. And um, so if you have enough GDPs as one car per family, you want two cars per family and so on and so forth. But there's more to wealth than just how many cars you own or how big a house you live in. Uh, there's also the state of your health, the state of your vitality, especially as you age. And so we would also consider part of wealth, longevity and the quality of life in all age. Do you feel safe, secure? Are you are free to express your ideas? That's the quality of life. Is there continued education? Is there a living comfort? These are all things uh, that we consider quality knife. So it's not just GDP. And so let me close by reminding you that we live on a planet and unlike the Europeans going from the old world of Europe to a new world, we can't just say if we've ruined this planet, we can go live in another planet. The good news is we've discovered that there are more planets than stars in our own galaxy, uh, that there are planets that appear to have the right conditions of enough distance from the star, uh, enough mass that can contain an atmosphere, that it's possible that these planets can harbor life. But you simply can't go from where we are to anywhere close by. The, uh, the Milky Way is vast, it's 50, uh, 50 light years distance and, um, and that's a long way. And not only that, there's no way we can really get there and land safely uh, given what we have today. So, so I'll close by reminding you of one of my favorite pictures. It was taken in Christmas Eve, 1968. And uh, in this picture, you see the lunar landscape and off um, 
is a picture of the earth. The astronaut who took the picture said, we came all this way to explore the mean. And the most important thing is we've discovered the earth. But since 1968, we've discovered that humans are changing the climate of the planet. Uh, the predictions are coming true faster than we thought. Uh, these are very significant and they uh, could cause a great deal of upheaval and uh, suffering. And um, so it's up to us to change. With that, I'll stop and uh, take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. This is a very, very illuminating uh, talk. Uh, now, those of you who are online, you could raise your hand, indicating hand, or you can text question. While you are doing that, perhaps I can ask those on the floor here. Any questions? Those of you are uh, happy to pose some questions? Perhaps I'll start with one question, Steve. You mentioned about mm -hmm. you see in the uh, uh, in Fifth Avenue the number of cars and the number of horses. Now we have all if we assuming that we change even ninety percent or eighty percent of all the internal combustion to EV, how do we going to solve the battery problem? Could yeah. So and, yeah. And basic. So there are several parts of the battery problem. One part of the battery problem is. Um, uh, you can't just discard the batteries. Uh, there are pollution issues uh, with the materials like lithium. Uh, and even if you can extract very economically lithium from seawater, you still want to recycle the lithium. Uh, uh, all these, anything you do, everything humans do, there is this uh, waste problem. And so, um, so there are actually businesses being founded now to begin to design batteries so you can recycle the lithium. The cobalt and nickel, of course, if we continue to use cobalt and nickel, that's also very valuable. Um, but my prediction is cobalt is just way too expensive and even nickel is going to be way too expensive. So you need to recycle the material just as we haven't figured out how to recycle concrete. If you have old concrete, you can chop it up and but it's the only use for non-structural materials. Uh, we can recycle steel and aluminum, uh, but this whole recycling has to get very serious. All the things we do, there's no real true sustainability. We still are using up the earth's resources. We're slowing it down. <laughs> and But recycling is a very important part of all of this. All right, thank you, Steve. All right, we have some questions from the uh, from online. Uh, let's see, there's one from Wong Kalai. Can you see that? Uh, I'm not sure you can see it. But the question is, the uh, given that human animal fat is such a high in energy density, is there any efficient way to extract energy from human or animal fat? <laughs> well, <laughs> I wish we can do that. <laughs> we Many people wish they could take away the human fat without expensive liposuction. <laughs> <laughs> yep. um, but um, no, I think um, uh, the better way is <laughs> it's better for your health not to be fat, <laughs> number one. Number two, uh, it's a very inefficient way of generating energy. Right to raise food, to raise animals, to make fat, to make hydrocarbons is extremely inefficient. And so the, the thing we need to do is figure out how to make liquid hydrocarbons. We will still need liquid hydrocarbons for air transportation because it fuels very quickly and it has the best uh, energy density. And so, But how do you do that without using petroleum, well, you've got to do, this is going to be some novel chemistry or use microbial methods to break down um, plant materials, things like that. We don't have a means yet of being competitive, even twofold with uh, airplane fuel. It's more than twice as expensive. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, I think, uh, 
we need to find some liquid hydrocarbon fuel. If it's one and a half times more expensive, uh, given, given the predictions of what we're gonna see, it might be worth it in order to do it. But you should also remember that in terms of air travel, the fuel for the entire airplane ticket is about a third the cost of your ticket. It's very significant. If it was 10%, it wouldn't be an issue. You could double the price. <laughs> uh, but actually increasing the price of airline tickets might also be um, worth doing, especially um, um, you can actually, you know, it tax the business class <laughs> higher <laughs> for those reasons as well. Uh, you put a carbon tax on that. Yeah, they did. Well, we have one online by uh, Hu Bingzhen. Raise your hand. Is he online? He can post, uh, he or she can post the question. No. So you're, you're fighting for it. Uh, uh, perhaps I move to attack the one on the text question. With all the exciting technologies in the horizon, to what extent do you think patent protection is a useful institution for creating incentives for innovation or an obstacle for pushing for green energy on a global scale? Yeah, this is this is a very good question because on the one hand, um, uh, patents uh, have been used in order to get companies to invest in something uh, so that they can reap the benefits of their investment. It's also uh, uh, used as an incentive for the inventors. Um, I kind of unusual, I don't really care. I haven't tried to start companies and things like that. Uh, and Stanford gets all the patents anyway, which is fine. Um, but, um, but there are going to be some technologies that you really want to get out there as quickly as possible. And, and how you actually get these inventions deployed quickly, where you have the necessary investments to make it large scale, is the real question um, because things are moving too slowly. And if there really is a terrific invention, you want it be, to be disseminated as quickly as possible. Um, now, one of the things, for example, and just use COVID as an example, the, the mRNA vaccines that were developed by two American companies were incredible technology. They were after years of research and mRNA and how you actually protect the messenger RNA from getting uh, to be introduced into a cell. It required new novel techniques uh, using lipids and it required capping enzymes so it could protect the mRNA so that cell wouldn't attack it as a foreign material. So it can actually be used by the cell machinery to use that messenger RNA to make the protein uh, that could elicit an immune response. Um, the COVID vaccine, once the spike protein uh, sequence was determined, it, the structure came out very quickly. It could be done because it's simple. And the vaccine was actually designed within a week. And we can soon do another design of the Omicron vaccine. Now, I would have preferred if that intellectual property could have been licensed and low cost to many, many countries around the world uh, because it would be the better thing to do. <clears throat> and so that's an example it, that if you don't do that and you just say, I just want to maximize my profit, uh, then um, you actually endanger humanity and as we've seen. Uh, right, uh, Mr. Hu, Mr. Hu is online, so he can ask the question. Mr. Hu, please go. Uh, I don't, as, 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 so first of all, thanks uh, Professor Wei, and uh, I'm a alumni from the computer science department before, but I, I knew you and I knew many of your students. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. I, 
I don't have a specific question, but it's very interesting on in the climate change. And also I work for HSBC. It's also very important for, for our bank as far as I know. But it's far away from what I'm doing right now, but I think it's one of the most one of the most important agendas set forth by our senior managers, CEO, and um, we have to work hard on that. I'm happy to to learn from all of you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Very so we have one uh, one online question, which I think I'm sure uh, Steve, you're going to love this. It says, uh, "Well, thanks for the inspiring high vision and down to earth talk." He's a PhD, he's a, I'm a PhD student now studying climate change from social science perspective. May I ask what do you think the power shift in US Congress related to the attention on climate change issue? Well, um, <laughs> uh, there are many people in Congress uh, who um, are taking a view that is not as serious as I think it is. And, uh, and in part because uh, a lot of wealth generation in the United States is, comes from the fossil fuel industry. And so they do not really want to see the transitions occur that quickly. Um, or at least that's my view. Uh, I, uh, because I look at what, you know, the fossil fuel companies are doing and they're trying to just say okay we understand climate change is a serious issue but we don't really want to go that fast now the reality is you can't go that fast uh in the sense that i would dearly love to see that we become carbon neutral by 2040 2050. Uh, the predictions in order to stay below two degrees is you have to be carbon negative by 2075, carbon negative means everything we do, power generation, making steel and cement and plastics, agriculture, process heat of any kind has to be less than zero, okay? Less than zero means only one thing, you have to grab it out of the atmosphere and sequester it safely. And that has to be done at the well, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions around the world is 50 gigatons, 40 gigatons of CO2 and the rest is equivalent. 50 gigatons, okay, just a minute. That's my alarm clock. Just to remind you, I promised a postdoc, he and I are gonna finish not modifying the paper. We got some comments back from our other co-authors and we need to do okay. this, so I promised him <laughs> in three more minutes, I'm going to sign off. <laughs> right. Okay. That's. Uh, but but anyway, but but I think I think I think it, it's become very obvious to most Americans that the climate's changing, and they're beginning to accept that humans cause it, but they don't seem to care as much about what's going to happen 10, 20, 50 years from now. Uh huh. Good. Uh let me see. There's a, there's quite a lot of here. Let me take a quick, uh, perhaps one last question. Uh, somebody asked here uh, or here. Where do you think the the circular bioeconomy from waste materials such as food waste, agricultural waste, etc., contribute to the mitigation of the GHG emission and climate change? Well. Uh... It, it first you want to design agriculture so it generates less greenhouse gas emissions then you want to be able to recycle everything uh, but right now what we do is we for example when we plant food uh, whether it's corn wheat rice whatever uh, all the byproducts the rice straw the wheat straw the corn stover gets buried underground you used to burn it in developing countries still burn it, but not allowed to burn anymore. So you bury it underground and it makes methane. And so all of this has to be rethought because, because this is really generating lots and methane is significantly worse than carbon dioxide. So this, this whole thing has to be rethought and how you actually do this. It's very hard, but it, I think it's possible. 
Uh, but there are definite technologies that one needs in order to recycle these things and to capture all the to be made methane as well. And in fact, one of the great hopes is that by growing plants for food, it turns out that photosynthesis just for food and grazing animals actually fixes more carbon dioxide than what we emit around the world, just our food crops. Uh, so if you can, you know, and they use sunlight power to actually grab the carbon dioxide out of the air and photosynthesis. If you can use what you want to in the plants for both food and materials, and then sequester the rest of the carbon dioxide, you have a, actually a huge uh, carbon capture machine, but we don't do that. <laughs> So that's another technology. So one more question, and then I've got to go. <laughs> right, right. I want to call one colleague say, with all these uh, global warming and environmental effects, what we academics uh, and professionals can do? What more we can do? Oh, there's a lot you can do. Um, I've changed the course of my research, not all of it. I still do bio fundamental biology and and. For, and also for medicine. But I'm working now on batteries. I'm working on lithium recovery. I'm working, um, I'm thinking about energy distribution, things like that, you know. And, and so depending on whether you're technical or not, you know, all the information sciences, the artificial intelligence, all of those things will be needed to, in order to coordinate the grid. Uh, we need all these things, both in, in biology and chemistry and physics and all these, and I've just indicated several of the challenges. If we had much better solutions, we could get there much faster. But in addition to that, we also need economists. We need people in political science. Uh, we need people in sociology, psychology, because, because there's a fundamental issue here that we've never had to deal with as humans before. Never have scientists ever told us in the history of us that what we're doing today will have a profound bad impact 50 and 100 years and 200 years from today. We always thought that's someone else's problem. And, and, and now we're seeing very clearly, no, that's everybody's problem. And unless you don't care about any future generation, uh, people as old as us, <laughs> I mean, we've betrayed our children and grandchildren. I'll be candid about this. Uh, we're not pushing hard enough. And so, uh, you know, again, I've spent since around 2000 and certainly since 2004, a significant fraction of my entire life on this, um, as, as I began to learn how serious this is, we need more people to do that, but we also need everybody else to recognize it's worth it. You know, is it worth 10%, 20%, 30%? It's, I think it is, <laughs> uh, given, given what we've seen already, and it's gonna be much, much worse because of what we already know about the climate models and, and how the weather has so changed and, and you know, collapsed economies and political and in social instability is not going to be good. It's like COVID-19 COVID on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. I like that one. Oh, okay. okay yeah. so Thank you, Steve. And thank you, everyone. And I'm sorry, there is, there's a lot, a lot of other uh, questions, but I'm afraid we don't run out of time. So we'd like to thank uh, Professor Stephen Chi again for a very, very wonderful and uh, illuminating talk. And Steve, we hope to see you in person soon. All right. Well, you know, I hope so. Um, and I'm willing to go on record as willing to pay 20% more, 30% more for my airline ticket. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we got it done. We got it written down right here. All right. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. And good evening to you, Steve. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye. <laughs>